Good morning. Welcome to worship at North Bethesda United Methodist Church on this first Sunday in Advent. We're so grateful to all of you who stayed after worship last week to transform our sanctuary to bring more light and beauty and signs of Christ coming into the world. You'll see on the back of your bulletin that we are moving through Advent with Bible studies and with Tuesday evening services. There's a Bible study that we'll meet tomorrow at noon on Zoom, and then another group of the same study will meet on Tuesday at 6 p.m. in the parlor. Following the 6 p.m. Bible study, we have a 7 p.m. Taizé service here in the chancel area. All are welcome. You could just come to the service if you choose. That's just a 30-minute service from 7 to 7.30. You'll see also that we are, Christmas is, we are in the month, and Christmas Eve falls on a Sunday this year. So we'll have the fourth Sunday of Advent in the morning on December 24th. We're having a brunch church in the fellowship hall. We had a brunch church in June, just this past summer. So we'll have a, a similar gathering where we will pray and sing and eat together. We hope to open that table to some folks who are living in a group home nearby or others who might need or want a place to gather with the family of God for a good meal on Christmas Eve. So I hope you can make it too. We'll then have two Christmas Eve services, one at 5 p.m and one at 9 p.m. And we're looking for all manner of helpers for those services. So send me an email if you are able to help with that. You'll see in the narthex and in the fellowship hall that our arts committee and our service and outreach committee are offering opportunities to give beyond your usual circle of friends and family this Christmas. There is a wagon collecting toys for the children who are, are staying at the women and children's shelter on Green Tree Road. And then the service and outreach committee is doing their gifts of caring in which you can donate to one of several organizations, both local and global in honor of a friend or a family member and give that as their gift for this holiday season. Lastly, oh, second to lastly, <laughs> you came into worship and received two sheets of paper today. This is the communion liturgy we'll be singing as part of our Advent celebration. It's to the tune of Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. So when we get to that point in the service, Simone will be playing on the piano and I will lead us along with the choir to sing those responses. And lastly, I saw it, I'm not sure if you did, when I came in today, the fellowship hall is looking very festive and fun. There is a hot cocoa bar after worship that Joanne and Sue and other members of our uh, membership and evangelism committee have set out. It is beautiful and fun, and I hope you will stay after worship for a special coffee hour. And now I invite you to allow yourself to fully arrive here in this space where God meets us with a word of hope and a sure I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we join in our call to worship led by our liturgist Gordon. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Your responses are in bold. O oh, deep in darkness, make room for us. O oh, oh, luminous darkness, bring mystery near. We gather to worship, O oh God, seeking your light. Bless us in our worship that we may see your light. Bless us that we may see your light. The light of Christ. Amen. Our opening hymn is People Look East. United Methodist Hymnal number 202.
Betsy Jennings are lighting the first candle of our Advent wreath today. And after the prayer, we will join together in singing. The tune is Breathe on Me, Breath of God, and the words are printed in your bulletin. This morning, we light the first Advent candle, the candle that traditionally stands for hope. We want to hope, but it's hard. The world around us is desperate for the bare minimum, for knowing where the next meal is coming from, for assurance that our democracy will hold for a continued ceasefire in Gaza. We are a practical people, a realistic people. We know what we're up against. We know not to set ourselves up for disappointment. And yet, our faith calls us to a radical, shocking, unrealistic, and reckless hope a hope for more, more than enough abundance, more than stability thriving, more than a ceasefire, a true and lasting justice and peace. This morning, we light this fragile flame as we wait for a hope that seems out of reach trusting in a God who promises to be within our reach. Let us pray. God of possibility, give us the courage to hope for more than we otherwise would. In all our ways, let us trust you. Amen. Today we have a little lesson in the Advent wreath. It is a tradition that started centuries ago in Europe in places where it got very, very dark in winter. And folks would light one candle per week, marking progress toward Christmas. Does anyone, Vera and Jesse, so beautifully lit the candle of hope, does anyone know what the other candles are lit for? We've got peace. What else? Joy. And love. We have hope, peace, joy, and love. And I'm going to tell you about a conversation I had. I'm, I'm in a, a text conversation with uh, several other United Methodist pastors. And the other day, there was a question that came up was, should we light the candle for peace this year? When it is so clear that we do not have it, that it is, it is not apparent in some of our lives and most certainly in our world. Should we just not like, and, and while we're at it, what about joy? <laughs> or what about love? Or what about hope? And what we came to in this little group and what I offer to you is that we don't light these candles for things that we already have. 
we don't proclaim that that we all the time have joy or that if you want to come to church in advent you got to have peace in your life we like them because they're things that we need and things that we are praying for and so each week we add a little bit more light as an act of prayer as an act of faith as something that we can do while we are waiting for all of these things to come in fullness and so we will by christmas eve have all of our candles lit because we are saying we need these things and we trust that they come through christ will you pray with me please you can repeat after me loving god in this room in our country and in our world we need you we trust that you are here and we trust that your peace is coming amen those who'd like to may go with miss grace for prime time at this time and our choir will offer us an anthem about waiting
Thank you, choir, for that message. We are indeed waiting. Our scripture today is from Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 to 9. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would crake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and in our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our father. You are the clay, we are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. Thanks be to God for this message. Will you pray with me, please? Remember, God, we are all your people. We pray for softened hearts and open hands and willing spirits in the name of Christ. Amen. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Welcome to Advent, where the readings for this first Sunday reliably start us off in kind of a mess. The same mess of despair that seems to come around year after year, generation after generation. The speaker in Isaiah cries to God five centuries before Christ after the exiles had returned to Jerusalem from Babylon and things were all wrong. Come down, O Lord, so that the nations would tremble, so that even the mountains would quake. You used to do awesome things back in the day, the speaker says, but now you've cut us off and life is rotten. The Judites were barely surviving. There were rampant raids. There wasn't food. There didn't seem to be a God. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Come and fix it, God. And Isaiah has a very clear vision for how he wants God to appear. Come down with fire. Come down with your mighty power. Shake things up. Make the nations tremble. Come in here and set things right. When I was in eighth grade, it was my birthday, October. I was in Miss Helms' physical science class, and she gave me a happy birthday pencil. It was silver and glittery and very cool. She left the room, or something, momentarily, and this boy who sat across from me, Kenny, took my pencil. He was just messing with me. He spun it around on his fingers. He pretended to break it. He held it out of reach. He laughed and laughed and laughed. Now, as an only child, I was no match for this. I got so mad. I had no idea how to handle it. I burst into tears. Welcome to age 13. 
I just wanted Miss Helm to come back in the room. Bring justice. Get me my pencil back from stinking Kenny. <laughs> it seemed like an eternity before she came back in the room and she noticed what was going on. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens. Authority one, one with power, please come in here and put the bullies in their places. Fight on my side and give me what I want, what I strongly believe is rightfully mine. In the ancient world, that was the whole point of having gods. Gods were there to fight on your team, to push back the other nations, to protect your nation, to make your people prosper in farming and warfare, give you all the resources to thrive. And maybe sometimes that's what we believe and behave is like is the point of God today. Come in here, God. Show up in a magnificent and memorable way and fight for the right side, which it goes without saying is our side. Come in like a parent who sees siblings fighting, a teacher who takes control of a classroom and punishes the ones who were making trouble, which is to say the other people over there. Where are your favorites, of course. Write this injustice. Show up like that, God. But God doesn't do what Isaiah asks in 500 something BCE, or really any time after that. There is no fire that rains down just on the bullies. There is no divine military leadership or earthquakes or mountain moving power plays, none of that. Isaiah cries out and nothing that he asks for seems to happen. God doesn't seem to do what we ask either a lot of the time. Like God doesn't smite our enemies or wave a magic wand and fix everything or end senseless suffering, take the guns from people's hands and throw them into the abyss. The horrors just keep happening, no matter how brilliantly or passionately we pray. And so what to do about the seeming absence of God? What do we do in this year, in our lives, in our own personal griefs, in the heavy, tragic suffering of the world? Isaiah laments that because you are so silent, God, because you've not shown up the way how we want you to, the people have stopped looking for you. They have abandoned worship because it seems pointless. There's no one who calls on your name, Isaiah says in verse 7, or attempts to take hold of you because you've hidden your face from us. If God isn't going to help us the way we want to be helped, well then what's the point? That seems like a prevailing thought line in today's world too, no? If the point of a God is to fight for us, to protect and preserve and wow us and come exactly as we ask, and this is almost entirely not happening, then maybe there is no point. Maybe no one is on our team. Maybe there is nothing more, nothing better. The people have given up trying to contact God, Isaiah says, they've hung up the phone. If your end is going to be silent, ours is too. But not entirely, right? Not everyone. Isaiah is hurt and confused and angry and feels abandoned by God. He says, no one is praying anymore, but he is. Despite almost zero evidence that it will work, something still spurs Isaiah on to keep crying to God. And a few others like him did too, and some more in the generations that followed and some more after that. Everywhere around the world and across time, there have been pockets of people holding on 
Even if they don't know exactly why they hold on, they do, and they cry out to God because they will not settle for the world as it is, and they believe in the depths of their being that God does not either. There are people who find a different point in crying out to God. One of my favorite books to read during Advent is a compilation of writings by Dietrich Bonhoeffer the German Lutheran pastor and theologian who spoke out persistently and unflinchingly against Hitler and the Nazi regime from the very beginning of their rise to power in the early 1930s. For 10 years, Bonhoeffer organized resistance and he preached. His sermons were broadcast on the radio. Despite everyone caving around him, he refused to budge or back down or bend to the heresy of Nazism. He was arrested in 1943 and spent the last two years of his life in a Nazi prison camp before being executed just 10 days before Hitler's forces started their surrender. This Advent devotional draws from the letters and other writings that Bonhoeffer sent during his two years in the prison camp. Now, if anyone could rightfully feel abandoned by God, could look at the world and conclude that there really was no point in religion, in faith, that God was in fact entirely absent or did not exist at all. If anyone could feel that, it might be Dietrich Bonhoeffer, age 37 in a Nazi prison camp in 1943. But instead, he sent letter after letter to his fiance, to his parents, to his friends, insisting that there was more good happening than was immediately visible, proclaiming the active presence of God, not just in the future, but right here. He writes on December 13th, 1943 to his fiance, be brave for my sake, dearest Maria, even if this letter is your only token of my love this Christmas tide, We shall both experience a few dark hours. We shall be assailed by the question of why, over and above the darkness already enshrouding humanity, we should be subjected to the bitter anguish of a separation whose purpose we fail to understand. And then, Just when everything is bearing down on us to an extent that we can scarcely withstand it, the Christmas message comes to tell us that our eyes are at fault. That is all. God is in the manger. Wealth in poverty, light in darkness, succor in abandonment. God is in the manger. Everywhere around the world and across time, there are people who trust that God does and will show up. Not how we demand it to happen, but in a way beyond what we even knew to expect. There are people who have realized that maybe our concept of power is not the point of God. A warrior, a smiter, A Santa Claus hander out of gifts, someone to fight our wars is not the point of God. That maybe there is a point we don't totally get yet, but are getting glimpses of, nudges. And maybe that point has a lot to do with love. And still we don't totally get it, but God has been trying to show up and trying to reveal this truth to us for centuries. All across time and space, there has been a quiet and largely unpopular tradition that says the point of God is love full stop. Radical, boundless, reckless, unstoppable, unconditional, cannot be put into a box or on a single team or made to belong to only one nation or one race or one anything free and life-changing and world-changing love. And that's why Jesus came. So we could get that. So we could be joined in with that love. 
From his confinement in a prison camp, Bonhoeffer writes, no evil can befall us. Whatever they may do to us, they cannot but serve the God who is secretly revealed as love. The tradition of Advent that we inherit is the tradition of people who could write words like that while watching their world be consumed almost by utter evil. And why it matters is because when the world is going up in flames, when powerful forces of evil are on the rise, tearing at the fabric of our world, someone has to resist it. Lots of someones have to resist it. And what fuels resistance is a belief that it does not have to be this way, that it in fact cannot be this way. That the point of God is love. What fuels resistance is the passion behind Isaiah's opening line, get down here, God, which frustrated and lonely and angry as it is, necessitates a conviction that there is a more and that the more cares and that the more has equipped and empowered and commanded us to press on and to have hope because there are infants being born right now. There are children coming up behind us who need to breathe, who deserve to be free, to have life and health and choices and joy. If folks like Bonhoeffer had given up on God, had caved to hopelessness, or prophets like Isaiah, or the leaders in South Africa, or Dr. King had just said, well, this is not even worth trying. I'm gonna try to have the most comfortable life for myself and my closest family members and let everything that is happening out there happen out there and God is dead to me. Well, then where would we be? What would our lives, our world be? The people coming after us, they're depending on us to live like we believe in a God who empowers us to be bold and persistent instruments of healing and transformation. We are the bearers of light for this round. The ones given the option and the responsibility to articulate that what we perceive on the surface is not all there is that there is love and creative power, movement toward justice, a turning, a God who so loves the world. And that is the point. God is gonna show up however God is going to show up. And it's not how we design it, and it's not always how we think it should look, and if this season gives us any clues about how God shows up and acts in the world, it is going to be creative and quiet, often surprising, sometimes subversive, rarely expected. And it always, always invites our participation, always gives us a role. And so we come to this table to remember, like Isaiah does in his prayer, to remember all that God really has done. To remember that the point of God is love. We come to this table because we are enfolded into the story, into the love, given a role. Given all that we need to change something about the world. And so first we pray in silence for all the places in our lives and in the world that hunger for God to show
I invite you to turn to page 15 of your hymnal and use the supplementary music that we have printed. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of grace, we thank you for out of the chaos and the darkness, you brought light. Out of the shadows of slavery, you brought us freedom. Out of the dark tomb, you raised Jesus to life. And now even in the darkness, as we look for your grace, we see your power at work and we know you are near. Entering into the brokenness of our world, you transform and bring forth life. Therefore, we join with all those who long for new life, and we sing your praise. of the world to redeem it, to redeem all who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Christ took bread, he offered thanks, he blessed and he broke it and he shared it with all who were there saying, take and eat, this is my body and it's given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he offered thanks, he blessed it, and he shared it with all who were there, saying, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you and for all in a new covenant, which is the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. As often as we break this bread and share this cup, we remember his death and resurrection until he comes again. And so remembering these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Holy Spirit in these gifts of bread and cup that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ. Awaken your Holy Spirit in all of us that we may be for the world the body of Christ transformed by your grace and confident in your coming to your eternal glory and praise. we pray boldly the prayer of all your children, the prayer that Christ taught us to say in whatever language or words are closest to our hearts, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
the power and the glory forever. Amen. This table belongs to God. It is open to all who wish to come and receive a piece of bread, a cup of juice. There are places to put your cup on either side as you return to your seat through the side aisles. We also welcome your offerings for this morning. There are plates located in the back to receive those gifts. Thank you for your generosity. You may come at the direction of the ushers. I invite those who are helping to serve to come forward. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Help us to prepare for your coming again in hope and trust. Send us into the world transformed by your grace into the body of Christ to be signs that you are here. In the name and spirit of Christ, we pray. 
Amen. Our closing hymn is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. You will see that there are new words. Isaiah wrote in his particular moment in his place of history for the redemption of his nation, Israel. And as people wrote Advent hymns and prayers, they incorporated that tradition of Isaiah with Israel as like a stand-in to mean God is coming for all people. And it seemed to me that when we were using these prayers and these songs this particular December, that the prayers around Israel, ancient Israel, could be taken in a literal way, maybe drawing lines that we don't exactly intend because it is so complicated, is it not? And so, since the traditional words to O come, O come, Emmanuel, don't allow for the nuance of this particular moment, we are using words that are an attempt to pray for our world in its moment today. So I invite you to stand with heart or with body as we pray that Emmanuel will in fact come to all this weary land. Let us sing.
I forgot to mention that our youth group is meeting at 5 p.m. today at Faith UMC. We are decorating Christmas cookies. You definitely want to show up if you are in middle or high school for that. We also have a new members class, part two. We'll meet in my office around 11.15 after you go to the hot, co hot cocoa bar at coffee hour. And now as we go, I pray that you will leave this place as a sign of God's living presence, as a sign of Christ's abiding love, and as a sign that the Holy Spirit is in fact alive and well and working wonders in our world, go as a sign of great hope in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.